7.30. Welcome to the program. I'm Laura Tingle. Each year, hundreds of the world's best tennis players brave the summer heat to compete in the Australian Open. This year, organisers have taken a calculated risk, chartering 15 flights to bring more than 1,000 players and staff to Melbourne in the midst of a global pandemic. Just days after the first plane touched down, the tournament's unique system of COVID restrictions is already being put to the test, with six positive cases only three weeks out from the first match. But does it pose a threat to Australia's successful suppression of the pandemic? This report from Tom Joyner and producer Laura Cooley. Chaos is threatening the Australian Open with another case of COVID discovered on a flight bringing players in from overseas. There are now 72 Australian Open players in hard quarantine. It's not worth the risk. Be selfish. Look after ourselves. We want to keep Victoria open. We don't want to go into lockdown. We don't want more people to die. We don't want to be locked in the house. After a year of cancellations, the Australian Open was meant to kick off 2021's international tennis calendar safely and smoothly. Sorry I didn't make the bed. I don't think I will many days. <laughs> New Zealand doubles player Artem Sitak arrived late last week on a flight chartered by Tennis Australia from Los Angeles. We got to the Melbourne Air Base. We went through all the security, uh, all, the, all the protocols over there, uh, which was uh, very well organised. Uh, then we had buses uh, that took us to our respective hotels. It was very long, obviously, people were tired, and, but uh, relatively smooth, yeah. But soon after arrival, news of a positive test result from his flight meant he would spend the next 14 days in hard quarantine, unable to leave his room, even for training. I have a bike in my room, I have a lot of equipment. This is my uh, exercise area. Tough, obviously, to stay in shape uh, being in the room, but uh, try to do as, as much as I can. We had a call with the ATP and Tennis Australia, and uh, it, was, it was very clear. They said that uh, if there is a case, it's going to be up to the health authorities to decide what to do in the particular case, in the particular scenario. So for me, it was clear what was going to happen. Is I know how difficult it was for Melbourne, how, how tough the, the lockdown here was, uh, how long people were locked up. And so I was prepared for that. But not all players say they were warned beforehand that they would need to quarantine if there was a positive case on their flight. We made our decision to come here from rules that were sent to us, tweeted Swiss world number 12 Belinda Bencic late on Saturday night. Then we arrived and received new rules that we did not know about. And I know there's been a bit of, bit of chatter from a number of players about the rules. Well, the rules apply to them as they apply to everybody else. And they're all briefed on that before they came. Meanwhile, world number one Novak Djokovic reportedly sent a list of requests to the Open's tournament director, including for players to be released from hotel quarantine into private housing with tennis courts. Tennis Australia did not respond in time for broadcast. I'm, I'm here not so much to be... Uh, opining about the uh, uh, how in touch with the real world some of these people are. That's not my job. My job is to make it very clear. People were told what the rules were. The rules will not be changing uh, because the public health advice is where those rules came from. Allowing those people to go out and practice just increases the risk that COVID-19 will be transmitted within the community. These people aren't so special that they're not going to get COVID-19. They're not so special that they can't spread COVID-19. So they shouldn't be so special to, to be able to not abide by the quarantine that, that the rest of us do. I think the players should be conscious of what, and reading the room, of understanding what the situation is in Australia. Journalist Ben Rothenberg covers tennis for the New York Times and believes some players might have been ignorant of the recent history of Melbourne's harsh lockdown. And even what it was going to be there in Melbourne with uh, players you know, being allowed out for five hours a day to go train and things like that. That's not, those aren't privileges that have been afforded to normal people coming into the country. So tennis was already getting a little bit of bending uh, from the Victorian government. And, and now that that is snapped back, uh, I think it's caused a lot of whiplash for tennis players who haven't really felt a, a full crackdown like this previously. For remaining players who have not been exposed to a positive case, they'll be allowed five hours of restricted training per day in a designated facility. I 
concern continues to be the practice, um, so them having five hours of practice per day. This is very different than the typical person that's in quarantine, so it does expose them to more people. Uh, and I would say for tennis players that refuse to follow or don't follow the rules, they, they shouldn't be allowed to play. So far, roughly 1,200 people have arrived on 15 chartered flights, with six positive cases linked to the tournament and 72 people forced into hard quarantine. Brett Sutton today uh, in the press conference um, talked about there being about a 1% rate of positivity amongst international travellers. No one should be surprised that someone was positive on, this, uh, on these flights. If we've already had these people over here, we already have the risk from these people uh, coming to Australia. Um, to not have the open at this point, um, to me, it's not about risk anymore. It's about something else. At the same time, I mean, the tennis players, you know, aren't the ones who decided to barge on in here. They were invited here or allowed to be here by the government. They're an easy scapegoat because they're sort of easy to paint as, you know, foreign, out of touch millionaires. And that, that makes them a soft target uh, in times like these. There are now three weeks to go until spectators arrive for the Australian Open. But until then, the world will be watching closely. A tournament like the Australian Open struggling um, would be chilling for the future outlook of the rest of the tour, for sure. Hoping that, you know, nothing else will come out. That's uh, the only thing we can hope for. The controversy about the Australian Open and last week's alarm about the potential spread of the UK strain of the coronavirus from a hotel in Brisbane are just the latest incidents to prompt questions about the hotel quarantine system. But there is a more fundamental question to be asked as the pandemic rolls on. Who is ultimately responsible for quarantine in Australia? And how resilient is the ad hoc system that has developed in a crisis in the longer term as we eventually have to open our borders once more however gradually. Amber Heard has been slapped with a summons. She's facing three charges for illegally importing dogs pistol and boo against quarantine. Agriculture laws. Minister Barnaby Joyce has defended Australia's tough biosecurity laws. A lot of things we're easy going about, but we're not easy going about biosecurity. We're deadly serious about it. Until the coronavirus came along, the most recent Australian quarantine issue to attract attention, in fact, global attention, was the fate of two small dogs smuggled into the country by American actors Johnny Depp and Amber Heard in 2015. Pistol and Boo, and therefore Depp and Heard, were in breach of Australia's Biosecurity Act, passed that same year as the first comprehensive overhaul of one of the nation's oldest laws, the Quarantine Act of 1908. The Department of Agriculture would oversee the plants and animals. The Health Minister would keep powers to deal with humans. This is a very substantial piece of work and the culmination of over 100 years of experience. It is expected that human health provisions contained in the bill will be seldom used. However, it is important that legislative powers are available to manage serious communicable diseases should they occur. Human quarantine has been a big issue going back to the days when visiting ships could bring infectious diseases into the colonies. Quarantine was in fact the only health power given to the new federation in 1901 and has been used to deal with threats ranging from smallpox to the ravages of the Spanish flu in 1919. It's thought at least 50 million people died. But the carve up of responsibilities between the federal government and the states has always been problematic. Fast forward to the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic last year. Tonight, new drastic measures on coronavirus. In March, with the decision to require all returning Australians and other travellers to quarantine for 14 days, a deal was struck between Scott Morrison and state and territory leaders. The states and territories are running hotel quarantine as part of their broader responsibility for public health, despite it being a federal role under the constitution. The states agreed to run the quarantine system and fund most of it. You might find that surprising given the usual fights over money. But the states give a number of reasons why they were happy with this arrangement. They needed Canberra to use its Centrelink systems to distribute income support to casual workers who might be holding down multiple jobs and as a result be spreading the virus. There was also, quite frankly, a lack of confidence in Canberra's capacity to run the quarantine system. States point to the fact that one of the biggest crises was in the federally regulated aged care sector. Finally, it was not just international borders that had to be considered, but interstate ones. 
From the federal government's perspective, it has been saved a lot of money and been kept clear of any political fallout from systemic failures in hotel quarantine. In all other states and territories, I think the experience has been quite different to Victoria and that is a great shame in Victoria. It's good that the states took their share of getting the job done, but ultimately it's the Prime Minister and the federal government who are constitutionally responsible for quarantine. And we've had outbreaks from quarantine in four separate states. There have been a number of inquiries into the system, notably the Halton Review of Hotel Quarantine Arrangements and the Senate inquiry into the response to COVID-19. The hotel quarantine system is vulnerable to breaches and these are hard to eliminate. It's also an expensive resource and comes at a high cost to individual, social and economic wellbeing. The review found using hotels for quarantine was essentially the best option when it was set up. But it suggested a national quarantine facility be established and kept at the ready in the case of a sudden surge in incoming cases as travel takes off again. The federal government has been sending people brought back to Australia on repatriation flights to Howard Springs, a disused workers' camp in the Northern Territory that can handle 850 arrivals a fortnight and it plans to send more to sites in Canberra and Tasmania. In an interim report last month, the Senate inquiry into the handling of the pandemic argued there remains a number of options that the Australian government could utilise, including expanding Commonwealth-funded quarantine facilities to help get stranded Australians home. And Why isn't the Commonwealth solving it, like opening the, quarantine facilities, the, the running them, the, using the ADF? As, I mean, as you understand, Chair, the Commonwealth obviously doesn't have a public health capacity. The ADF element is a, a point that, of course, has been raised. The ADF, all medical personnel in the ADF amounts to 935 staff. They are almost all deployed, supporting the states and territories already. So the real, the real limiting factor in increasing quarantine capacity is the availability of trained medical professionals. And this brings us to the biggest question for the quarantine system in the future. Who staffs it and who pays for it? Right now, the federal government's contribution in dollars and manpower comes from the deployment of 1,500 Defence Force members to the system. Quarantine is chewing up huge state police resources too. For example, there are 900 Victorian police officers working in that state system alone. I don't think a shortage of doctors is the main pressure on quarantine. It involves security, it involves transport, and the strains we've seen on the quarantine system have come from just those points, security and transport. Now, they are things the Commonwealth has plenty of resources uh, to assist with. A new debate about whether to change the quarantine system, including using mining camps, was started last week by Queensland. I'm going to put this forward as an option to the federal government. Howard Springs works very well in the Northern Territory and there's no reason why we couldn't do something similar here in Queensland or if not around the country. Another idea is to move quarantine hotels to regional areas. We have about 5,000 people in our quarantine system at any one time and three and a half thousand staff. So it would be very challenging to find uh, a regional area that could cope with that. But secondly, um, our public health officials have indicated that that would create further risks for us, particularly in transporting people on buses. It all points to an interesting conversation at this week's National Cabinet meeting. We did approach Federal Health Minister Greg Hunt for an interview, but he wasn't available tonight. You can find a statement from the Federal Government on our website. And we'll continue to look at the issue of Australians stranded overseas. If you'd like to share your story, you can email us at 7.30 at abc.net.au. It seems incredible given we've experienced an unprecedented economic slump, but house prices could be just beginning an extraordinary boom, according to the Reserve Bank. It's because of interest rates at record lows. There have been housing booms before, usually with lower interest rates, but never in Australia's history have they been this low. The cash rate is now just 0.1%. In documents first reported by nine newspapers, the central bank looked at the effect of such low rates now and into the future. Driving much of this shift is a big change in the property market. Older Australians trying to lock in a return they can live on are investing in property instead of putting money in the bank. That's producing a big shift in lending for housing. The new investors are cash rich and many don't need to borrow. Instead, the new boom in housing credit growth comes from owner occupiers, particularly first home buyers. The RBA expects house prices to go up and they could boom by as much as 30% over three years. 
although the bank says it will crack down on lending standards if it leaves borrowers in too much debt. Danielle Wood is the Chief Executive of the Grattan Institute. Danielle Wood, do you agree with the Reserve Bank's assessment of the property outlook? The RBA's research shows that historically a 1% fall in the cash rate, if it's temporary, will boost house prices by about 10%. There's obviously a range of factors at play here, but it's probably in around the right ballpark. What factors are at play this time that are different from uh, previous occasions when the market has moved? Well, what we know this time is we are in the middle of a pandemic-induced recession. Uh, there's a number of downside risks, most particularly the health outlook. Uh, if we see another wave of the virus, that's clearly going to impact on the economy and demand for lending. Um, there's also the fact that international borders are closed. Um, so our very strong immigration program has historically been supporting house price demand. I think realistically, we're probably not going to see a return to anything like business as usual for, for immigration and population growth, probably until the start of 2022. That suggests very different dynamics, doesn't it, for the property market. You don't have high immigration, as you mentioned, and now you've got this uh, group of older investors who are cash rich, they're not investing for uh, negatively geared investment returns. It, it does point to really different pressures on the market in the next two or three years, doesn't it? That's right. But on the other hand, we're seeing um, you know, very strong growth in lending among first home buyers. Um, some of those who, you know, the ones that haven't lost their jobs during COVID that have had their incomes hold up, uh, they've actually found it easier to save during the pandemic because a lot of those discretionary spending options are out the door. Uh, and at the same time, that reduction in the cash rate uh, very significantly increases their capacity to borrow. And, you know, as those buyers return to the market, that's really where we see that upward price pressure over the next year. And is it also a bit safer for the banks if you've got owner-occupiers uh, getting into the market, as you mentioned, and fewer people being really heavily geared in, in the investment sector of the market? That's right. And the Reserve Bank's obviously watching this quite closely. Their note makes clear they are worried about an outbreak of risky lending. Uh, so through the Financial Council of Regulators, they're, they're watching things like those loan-to-value ratios. Uh, they, they don't seem to be worried just yet, uh, although they do point to the fact that um, the New Zealand government's about to impose some, some new lending controls to deal with risky lending. Uh, so it, it's very clear they're keeping a close eye on the situation here. Danielle Wood, thanks for your time tonight. Thanks for having me. It's Australia's most controversial renovation project, a $500 million makeover of the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. There are fears the institution is being transformed into something closer to a theme park, while eyebrows are also being raised at the hefty price tag. But those backing the development say the current memorial doesn't properly recognise our recent diggers. This report from Dan Conifer and producer James Elton. When I visit the Australian War Memorial, it has a huge and profound meaning for me. I think it does for others as well. The War Memorial for me is a bit like my heart and soul. Uh, it's part of me. Alison Cray is one of the most senior women to have served in the Australian Defence Force. She deployed as a peacekeeper to Cambodia and East Timor in the 1990s, before also serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. So uh, for me, there's really only a couple of very small displays in the Australian War Memorial where I can see myself or see the country that I went to support. The retired brigadier served three years on the War Memorial Board and is an active member of Canberra's veteran community. Alison and other volunteers established this memorial to recognise the nation's peacekeepers, one of the groups she says is not properly recognised by the Australian War Memorial just a kilometre up the road. A little bit of sadness because I can't take my family there and have them understand a little bit about what I've done. So today I am pleased to announce that the government is backing these plans, providing $498 million over the next nine years to see these plans fulfilled.
Those plans involve creating new entrances below the existing forecourt, a covered walkway between the main memorial building and a new Anzac Hall. The hall is set to be demolished and a bigger one built in its place. The current space allocated to contemporary operations, not just peacekeeping, but contemporary operations uh, from, you know, from Vietnam through to the Tarrancot Wall, I can do in about 15 strides. For Memorial Director Matt Anderson, the lack of space is summed up by the Afghanistan exhibition commemorating Australia's longest war. It's not adequate to tell that story in the exit corridor. They are entitled to the space so that we can speak to uh, you know, the nature of their remarkable service. I think the question of expansion is a nonsense. It's as simple as that. Brendan Kelson was director of the memorial for five years in the 1990s. If you're a good museum manager, you will adapt and use the spaces you have. You make things fit. He's a vocal critic of the redevelopment and fears there'll be too much focus on housing large hardware from Australia's modern wars. If it's going to be located in the memorial itself, it will turn it to truly a Disneyland, a military Disneyland uh, museum. And the memorial was never intended to be a military museum. That's not its function. And what should go into the memorial should be related to commemoration. There is no commemoration related to these, these, this hardware, which properly should go to Mitchell. The Mitchell Warehouse in Canberra's north is where big military vehicles are housed. I think it really does mess up the storyline of the Australian War Memorial if uh, it becomes a, a, a space for large pieces of mili military uh, equipment. For Karen Bird, tanks and fighter jets can't tell the story she once heard. Her son, Jesse Bird, survived his time in Afghanistan but developed post-traumatic stress disorder. In 2017, Jesse took his own life. The War Memorial currently doesn't speak to our family's loss of Jesse uh, because it do there's no real reference point there to the long-term cost of war. Karen Bird is proposing a sculpture be erected at the memorial, allowing visitors to reflect on the mental and physical suffering of returned service people. The cost won't be covered by the half a billion dollar redevelopment. She's been told to fundraise for the $750,000 required. I think it would be a wonderful expression on, from the War Memorial that actually somehow or other uh, money is allocated from, that, from those redevelopment funds on the grounds that it is the biggest story not told. John Denton is one of Australia's leading architects. It's a waste of money to demolish a building that's been designed and is fit for purpose and designed to, to um, be there for a long time. To be honest, we think it's a bit of a joke. <laughs> He's worked on projects for the War Memorial since the 1980s, including designing the current Anzac Hall. That award-winning building cost $12 million and is now slated for demolition less than two decades after it opened. The fabric of the building itself, providing it's maintained properly, will last, should last, you know, 100 years or more. It is probably one of the most significant buildings that we've done. We would be very sad to see, you know, very, very sad to see um, demolished. Why does the building itself need to go? Because we need more space. It's as simple as that. It simply wasn't cost effective for us to, to, to prop this building up, to come in, to dig down, to go down the nine metres, to build the extra floors and then put it all back together again. It was actually cheaper and better for the taxpayer to build a new building. There's a very strong case for making more resources available uh, for veterans and particularly those suffering mental health issues, the rate of suicide, all these things among these people that are coming back from these conflicts. I've had the assurances of the Minister for Veterans Affairs and the PM that it's not an either or, it's both. If we need more money for veterans, if we need more money for the mental health of veterans, they have it. The project still needs several more approvals before major works can start. Karen Bird does not oppose the expansion, but says the redeveloped memorial needs to tell the unsanitised version of Australia's war history.
And my son died because this country was not ready to look after him when he came home. I think it's a perfect opportunity for the Australian War Memorial to be part of the truth telling of what war is. And it's not glorious. And people who die don't fall, they're killed. And that has long-term repercussions for those who are left behind. And if that story has raised any issues for you, you can call Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36. In remote parts of the country, flying vets provide a vital lifeline. For the past year, Amelia Scott has been flying her own plane to see clients and their animals across western New South Wales, a vast area that stretches all the way from the Queensland border to the edges of Victoria and South Australia. This story from Rosie King and Donald Scheel. Any pilot will tell you that planes are just a money hole. <laughs> And they are. <laughs> Once you start flying, it's kind of an addiction. So this allows me to combine my passion and my work. G'day, I'm Amelia Scott. I'm a veterinarian. Uh, what I do is a little bit different to most vets. I don't operate out of a clinic. I operate out of a plane. I can fly four hours without stopping in this plane when full of fuel uh, and I can fly in a straight line from the New South Wales Queensland border down to the Vic New South Wales border. The clients I cover are all rural, most of them are graziers and farmers. They're always really happy to see you because it's a long way to the next vet. How you going? Bloody excellent. Fairly challenging. I, I don't think you'd want to be a, a new graduate straight out of uni doing it because it is you're doing it on your own. There's no nurses or any other veterinary support. Mm, little girl. She's probably a bit stressed. <laughs> yes, she's right. Her heart sounds good, which is the main thing. Well, for us, it's really good because we don't have to travel now 300 kilometres to go and see the vet in town. You just ring her and she comes, light comes in and sees us. So it's, yeah, it's really good. It's great. You don't really switch off from being a vet, whereas when you're, when you're flying, you can't be thinking about too many other things. You've got to concentrate on flying. So it's, for me, it's a really great way to disconnect a bit from being a, a vet. It doesn't feel like I'm working when I'm in a plane. I grew up always wanting to fly and then decided that I wanted to be a vet as well. And it sort of just meshed together and I thought, well, why not combine both? When I was growing up in that formative age, between five and 10, we were in a very bad drought and developed a love for animals and I saw a lot of suffering in that drought. Seeing animals die and not wanting them to die, sort of, that was what spurred me on to going, oh, I'll be a vet and save animals. Put those in your ears? You know how to put those in your ears? Yeah. My clients often are more than just clients. Whoa! I know, pretty cool, isn't it? Cool, isn't it? They're my neighbours, they're my community. They're not just yeah. keeping the bread and butter on the table. They're, they're sort of an extended part of my family and, um, you know, you've got to look after each other. Thanks very much. See you next time. So this property is a touch shy of 120,000 acres and we run sheep, Australian wild goats and cattle. It's 
I'll be the fifth generation to do it, along with my now husband. <laughs> I'm the uh, quiet bloke in the background. Um, I'm Amelia's now husband, I guess, as of a month ago. Amelia's a very strong woman. Um, she's very independent and very, very driven. If she wants something, if she puts her head to it, it's, it's gonna happen. <laughs> Looking back at what Amelia's achieved, um, it's phenomenal. When we were young, I said dream big, but this is getting pretty big. I love this life. I can't really explain why, I just do. I'd rather be um, out in the middle of nowhere with probably no people. So yeah, I, I love it. That's the program for tonight. Thanks for your company. Good night. Next on ABC.